Hello everybody, um, so my name is Deirdre um, and it's a pleasure to be here this evening. So I've worked um, in the area of nutrition and dietetics for the last 12 years and provided direct cover here for the last 10 years. Um, so the talk tonight is going to be an overview I suppose of general nutrition and exercise um, and its role in depression because there's a lot of myths out there um, to, so to dispel some of them but also to give everyone a good overview um, of what they should be doing um, not not solely for depression but for general health and then with with um, added um, interest then for for depression related okay so good nutrition is important for our mental and physical health and um, following a healthy diet can protect your mental health um, so hugely hugely important is the building blocks um, is what we eat um, very simple, it doesn't have to be expensive or heroic, but one needs to eat regular meals, um, very hugely, hugely important, and getting the right balance of fats. Um, whole grains, fruits, vegetable foods, including protein at every meal, including oily fish in your diet, and drinking enough fluid. So again, very basic, but sometimes hard to get in the day um, the right amounts. Um, so routine and regimens are hugely important. Okay, so eating regular meals. Um, I suppose an analogy would be that if you don't put um, diesel or petrol in your car, it won't run. So if you don't feed yourself with adequate food or fluid, then you're not going to work efficiently either. Um, we need to feed the brain regularly with the right mix of nutrients for it to work properly. Um, and as some people might not... Um, no, the brain cannot use fat or protein as a fuel. It has to use glucose. So funny diets where people eliminate certain um, macronutrients in the diet can be hugely um, ineffective. So steady supply of carbohydrate is essential throughout the day. And sources of carbohydrate would be your starchy foods, like your bread, your cereals, your pasta, your rice. Um, so these are important to have throughout the day um, to supply the, the brain with the energy it needs. These carbohydrates are broken down in the body and produce blood glucose, and that's the fuel. So we aim to eat little and often, so it is important that you have regular meals throughout the day, that you don't be skipping breakfast or skipping lunch, that you have a regular glucose supply throughout the day. Getting the balance right of fats. Fat is a huge topic in all countries in Europe, you know, from the point of view of saturated, unsaturated, and floras, and um, all those. But from a, a mental health um, and dietary point of view, the brain is made up of 40% fat. Um, brain cells need fats to maintain their structures. So no one's advocating a fat-free diet by any stretch. Um, you need an adequate supply of unsaturated fat to maintain health. Um, now, saturated fat would be your hard butter, your lard, um, whereas unsaturated fat are the um, more fluid fats like oils. So we always advise that people would try and cook with um, unsaturated fats, which would be olive or rapeseed, um, to add nuts and seeds to, to their dishes, to their salads, to their foods, and to use olive or nut oil dressings um, also. We would advise to reduce the intake of trans fats, because these are harmful for the brain structure, um, and also for your heart. Sorry, there's a typo there. Um, trans fats are found in a lot of processed foods, a lot of packaged foods, so ready-made things. Um, unfortunately, they add a lot of trans fats so that they hold together for longer, and that's why um, they, they last longer than some fresh foods. So burgers, sausages, processed meats, ready-made meals, um, they all contain a lot of bad types of fats. So we would advise that you use fresh ingredients or fresh foods where possible um, because of the positive nutrients that they provide. Um, also now, just to focus more in on whole grains, fruits and vegetables, hugely important in the diet um, for your body to function well. Whole grain cereals, um, so all your, your brown type cereals like porridge, um, Weetabix, bran flakes, um, fruit and fibre, um, peas, beans and lentils, nuts, seeds, all fruits, all vegetables, they're all hugely rich in vitamins and minerals that the body needs on a daily basis. 
Um, they're digested slowly, so they're broken down slowly, and they help to control the rate of glucose to the body, but also to the brain. Um, another important feature in, in meals is to include some protein, um, whether you're a vegetarian or a non-vegetarian. Um, to include protein at every meal is hugely important. Um, tryptophan is one of the building blocks of protein, so it's what makes up protein, and it's been proven to show a role in depression. Um, studies have shown that adding pure tryptophan, which is a building block of protein, um, can improve their mood. However, you can't just buy it as a pill. So you can't just take it in the morning and then not eat protein throughout the day. It's provided in protein foods. So protein is hugely important in the diet, and we'll go through sources of it later on. But just to touch on it, it would be things like meat, cheese, fish, chicken, yogurt. Um, protein also contains essential nutrients, and eating it little and often helps us to keep full which in turn can stop people overeating. Um, fresh meat, so these are just um, the best sources of protein that are in the diet, and the Irish diet would be fresh meat, fish, shellfish, eggs, milk, low-fat cheese, seeds, lentils, and beans, and they're huge sources of protein. You should fill around a third of your plate with the protein food. And that just gives you a rough portion size. Oily fish then. Oily fish is a huge topic in Ireland over the last, I suppose, five to eight years, especially with the whole Mediterranean diet um, and our, our other countries um, because we have such high levels of heart disease and other diseases from using real butter um, and lard. So now researchers are showing that omega-3s, which are found in oily fish, help to reduce depression rates. Um, and they're also important in maintaining a healthy diet. So we should try and include two to four portions of oily fish per week. Now that might sound a huge amount, but if you're having it either at lunchtime or dinner time, it just means two lunches out of the week and two dinners out of the week. So when you kind of have a meal plan for your week, it's, it's easy to incorporate it. Um, there is a little bit of caution if you're pregnant or breastfeeding or you're trying to become pregnant um, just from the amount of, of vitamin A sometimes. Um, so two to four portions of oily fish. Sources of oily fish are salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines, um, pilchards and trout. If you don't like fish, uh, which again um, some people don't, you may decide to take a supplement um, and obviously if you're not going to eat any fish a supplement isn't a direct um, alternative but it's it's a best fit um, you should choose a fish body oil because these don't contain vitamin a rather than a fish liver oil so again you when you go into boots or a pharmacy you can just help them to choose um, an omega-3 supplement for you um, so that you can decipher between a fish body oil and a fish liver oil. It will say it in the back of the pack. Um, and the reason we, we would advise to go for a fish body oil um, rather than a fish liver oil is that this vitamin A is very high in, in a fish body oil and this can be toxic um, at large doses because it's stored in the liver. Um, also to make sure that it's a high proportion of what we call um, good oils, so EPA and DHA, and these are very protective for the brain and the heart. So we would advise that you take up to one gram a day of these essential fatty acids, and you'll get that with your two to four portions a week. If you're a vegetarian, sources of high-quality omega-3 are limited, um, because obviously um, if you're not eating fish... So there are plant sources. They do not convert through to DHA and EPA very, uh, very well, but you can buy an algae-based supplement, um, but again, these are hugely expensive. So an alternative to these for vegetarians would be eggs and milk. Okay, so gaining or losing too much weight. If people find that they are perhaps either gaining or losing, they should ask the doctor to review their medications from the point of view of um, perhaps they've started on medications and their weight is going up, 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 
um, or else they've lost their appetite and they're hugely losing weight. So they should consult with the doctor just to review the dosage of the medications. Um, and often when weight is an issue, it's handy just to keep a track of what their weight is on a monthly basis so that they can pinpoint different medications, whether the dosage has changed or the actual medication has changed. Um, because some of them do stimulate your appetite and others suppress your appetite. I suppose when people start gaining weight on certain medications, it can have a a knock-on effect on their depressive symptoms by augmenting them, obviously, by their gaining weight. Um, And at that point, then, it's very important to include exercise, if it's not already established, to increase it, and to also look at the diet (coughs) and, and see about reducing intake. So to limit foods that are high in calories, so processed foods, pies, chips... Um, all the kind of confectionery, cakes, biscuits, um, chocolate, sugary drinks and alcohol, which are all hugely high in calories um, where weight is an issue. Again, on the other side, if people's appetite is suppressed and they're losing weight, they should also seek to see a dietitian um, because losing weight, again, in a negative way, can also augment depression um, if if it's losing rapidly. Okay. Hydration is another huge topic that can affect one's mood Um, and there's a lot of evidence to show that even a small amount of dehydration can affect your mood. So something so simple as having six to eight glasses of fluid a day can help to counteract that. Um, So hugely important even just to do a snapshot of one day in time just to see how much, even just to do a diet and a fluid chart for yourself to see what you're taking in both food and fluid, and it'll give you a snapshot then of how you're doing against the guidelines. Caffeine is another huge component in the diet that can also affect mood. Um, And again, if taken in large amounts, it can lead to withdrawal headaches um, or irritable moods when it's reduced. Caffeine is hugely found in coffee, coke, energy drinks, um, tea and chocolate. So if taken in large amounts, the caffeine intake in the body can be quite high. So we would say to avoid all energy drinks and to limit your intake to three cups of coffee or five cups of tea daily. Alcohol as well, classed as a fluid, has a dehydrating effect. So again, just to be aware of this if it's taken in excess. The other side of taking too much alcohol, it can lead to a vitamin B deficiencies and these can also um, exacerbate the symptoms of depression or anxiety type symptoms. Um, From the Department of Health guidelines, we would say to take no more than two or three drinks on no more than five days per week. Okay, so nutritional supplements, again, hugely popular advertising, people trying to to meet their requirements. So you've got a lot of advertising going on in pharmacies and supermarkets. Um, Who needs them? Um, If you're not eating well recently, um, if you're relying on ready-made meals or um, packaged meals, if you smoke a lot, if you drink a lot, you may then lack certain vitamins and minerals or you may require extra nutrients. What supplement to choose? You should choose a complete multivitamin and mineral supplement that contains a full range of all the essential nutrients. So one that contains 100% of the RDA, which is the recommended daily allowance. And these then are safe limits rather than high doses or mega doses of nutrients, um, which sometimes can be unsafe. Um, Certain cases can cause ill health, so it's very important that people don't be taking excessive amounts of vitamins and minerals without consulting with their, with their physician. So vitamins A and E, for example, they're fat-soluble, so they, you retain them in the body. So if you're taken in excessive amounts, you don't eliminate them, uh, and they be- can become dangerous over time. Uh, research has shown that folate, which is one of the B vitamins, can increase the effectiveness of... Um, antidepressant medication and again talk to your doctor if it's a case that you're perhaps a vegetarian and not eating a lot of meat because meat would provide um, a good source of um, B vitamin folate Uh, but also um, vegetables and whole grain cereals would also be providing folate so it is important to just check this out with your doctor. Healthy eating diet is paramount 
um, as supplements can't replace the goodness that you can get from a healthy eating diet. So taking a pill isn't equating to an actual diet. Um, so that's important. Okay, so a lot of people um, are at work five days a week or, or shifts or whatever. So it's important that not only do you have your health eating guidelines within your home place, but that you have it in your workplace as well. Um, a lot of us who would work full time, you spend two thirds of most days um, of the year in your workplace. So it's a great place to start making changes, not just in the home, but in the workplace. Um, Sometimes it's hard to find the time um, to prepare appetizing healthy meals. So have, being prepared and having a routine is hugely important. <coughs> okay, so weight. Again, there's loads of charts running around and people are comparing and contrasting, but um, no one weight is ideal for, for one and the other. Um, it's important um, that your weight reflects your height but also reflects your baseline weight over time. Um, if you have weight to lose, so if you are overweight uh, relative to your height, you need to set yourself a target and not something that stones away from, from what these tables say. Um, slow, steady weight loss is something that will last longer than doing something quick for a month or two and then putting it all back on. So it's very important to do things, lifelong measures, as opposed to restricting um, in a small amount of time and then going back to old ways. So little things like changing to, say, full-fat milk to low-fat milk, that'll make a difference over time. Switching from not frying you know, to, to, to grilling, again, over time, that makes a huge difference rather than just going on a, a very restrictive diet for a week or two and losing a few pounds and then it going back on. So BMI is the index that we use to work out what our um, weight is relative to our height to see if we are a healthy weight. Um, so body mass index can be worked out by your doctor and basically what it is is it's your weight divided by your height squared. So your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. And you get a figure then that will tell you whether you will be of normal weight for height, underweight or overweight. So a body mass index of 18.5 up to 25 is considered healthy. If it's above 25, up to 30, you're in the overweight range category. If it's greater than 30, you are considered obese. In Ireland at the moment, there's a huge percentage um, of the population in the overweight category um, and a little over 30% in the obese category too. So we are struggling uh, with um, overweight and obesity in, in the country. Um, so it is important to be aware of that. BMI does not show the difference in fat and muscle. It's not an accurate tool in some people. So for the elderly, it's not as accurate. For people who are hugely into um, weight training and stuff like that, it can be very um, inaccurate because muscle weighs heavier than fat. But for the general population, it's a guide. Okay, so you'll often see these charts in the doctor's surgery up on the walls or in the <coughs> chemists. They'll often have weigh-in tools and you can put yourself on them and they'll have all these charts. And again, it just plots your weight against your height. Now, the terminology isn't the nicest, but um, it'll tell you whether you're okay, overweight. I don't necessarily agree with the fat and very fat, but um, it's highlighting that you're going into the danger zone um, from a weight point of view. Okay, so again, they're just plotting your height, which is 5'4", their weight, which is in stones, so they're okay in that category, but they're going to the overweight. Okay, and that person there is 5'9", and they're in the overweight category. Waist circumference is another measurement that um, dietitians would often use or physicians to check people's middle spread, which again is another marker of um, danger, I suppose, from a health point of view. And again, you can do it at home with an L tape measure, um, certainly very ready, readily done. So for women, you're looking at a waist circumference that's greater than 35 inches means you're at risk, so you're not in a healthy range. Uh, and for men, then 40 inches 
again, you're at an at-risk measurement. And again, the old style, I suppose, apple and pear, again, just shows the body shape in a healthy versus an unhealthy point of view. So from a female point of view, it's very normal for girls to have hips um, and thighs. It's not normal to have um, the apple, which is, you know, a lot of fat around the abdomen. That's hugely um, dangerous from the heart point of view, but also from, from a mental health point of view. So a little bit of weight loss can change a lot in a lot of organs um, in the body. 10% weight loss, so let's just say someone is 80 kilos, so to lose just over a stone can reduce their incidence in a lot of the diseases that go with having extra weight. Your cholesterol could be high, you could be at risk of developing diabetes, you could be on blood pressure tablets. So again, small amount of weight loss can actually follow on to reducing um, your incidence of all these comorbidities. Now, this is a sample of the food pyramid. They've just updated it, so this is the one that's predated, but I have the new one here if you want to take a copy of it on the way out. And basically, it just gives a good synopsis of what you have, how much you have, um, and, and what is a portion, which is hugely important from a point of view of healthy eating. Um, so, essentially, from the top, you have the least amount of um, portions, down to the bottom, where you're allowed six or more. So they've adapted this over time, um, and it's basically just a guide for people to learn to eat healthily. Now, the only changes from this slide, which is the newly published one now, is that they've increased the fruit and veg to five plus. Um, so again, they want the Irish population to eat more fruit and veg. So five plus meaning that you know we fill up on fruit and veg, we get loads of vitamins and minerals from that. So basically on the bottom rung is all the carbohydrate products. And again, we were advising that you have portions of these at every meal, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you can see the examples of them would be bread, cereal, pasta, rice, um, potatoes. So again, you know, a source at breakfast, a source at lunch, and a source at dinner. It would be an incomplete meal not to have a starchy product um, from a blood glucose point of view um, to, to fuel the brain. Um, the next rung up from that would be your fruit and veg. So five or more. Again, it sounds like an awful lot of food. Sometimes some people be like, I'd never get you know, five or more in a day. But if you break it down into meals and snacks, have the fruit bowl full, have the salad vegetables or the veggies for your dinner, um, it's easily then to incorporate it into the day. Number three then is your milk, cheese and yogurt, which is a hugely important food group. Um, from a bone health point of view and protein. Um, so you've got your milk, your yogurt, your cheese, and these are all sources of um, calcium and protein in the diet. And again, either through a meal or a snack to, to get these um, into the day. Then your protein source, which is your meat, fish, <coughs> eggs, beans and peas. And again, trying to get a source at lunchtime and a source at dinner time. And then all the higher fat foods it's not that they're disallowed, but just in smaller amounts. So that's just a, a snapshot of what the food pyramid is, but it's just to guide you. And again, it's often handy just to do a one-day overview of what you're eating and drinking so that you have a rough idea um, how you're doing on it. Maybe you're not having enough fruit and veg. Maybe you're having too much of, of another food group. So it just gives you an idea to, to section it out and see how you're going. Now... Portion size is hugely important. Some people think, I'm doing everything right, um, I'm not sure what's up, and sometimes it's actually the portion size that's hugely off. So what is a portion? So from your bread, cereal, and potato um, rung on the food pyramid, we advise that you have six portions daily plus. So what is a portion? A portion would be one slice of bread. So if you have a sandwich at lunchtime, that's two portions of starch. If you have a bowl of cereal, that's one portion. If you have a medium potato, that's one. So if you have two potatoes, then that's two. So again, it's easy to incorporate it through the day, but just to be aware, because sometimes people will often find that they think they're eating nothing, but when they add it all up, they find then that they're perhaps um, eating more than what they think. 
Choose to high fibre cereal and breads frequently. So again, try and go for a good fibre source from the point of view of bowel health, but also vitamins and minerals. So when you're choosing bread, try to not focus on white bread as much. Try to go for whole grain, whole wheat or high fibre. Okay, so the fruit and vegetables, and there's a typo there because that should be five or more. Um, what is one portion? So one portion will be half a glass of fruit juice, two tablespoons of, of veg or salad, a medium-sized piece of fruit, or two tablespoons of cooked, and choose citrus fruits frequently. Your milk, cheese, or dairy. Um, again, a third of a pint of milk, which is 200 ml, so an average, an average small glass. Um, a tub of yogurt or an ounce of cheese, which would be the size of a matchbox. And again, to choose a low-fat um, choice from the point of view of um, fat content. Fish, meat and alternatives. Again, lean meat, cooked fish, eggs um, or, or peas, beans or lentils. Others, again, not that they're to be avoided, but just to be reduced or used sparingly. Sugars, again, to avoid excessive intakes. And alcohol, the Department of Health guidelines would be 14 units um, for women and 21 units for men. And it's not a target, it's just a guide. <laughs> now, um, I suppose everyone's looking for value for money these days, so it's awful that people go into places and if they see the supersized or God knows what and it's only 20 cent more, they tend to go for it because it's better value. But you have to nearly sometimes take a step back and go, right, okay, you know, do I need double the calories for 20 cent extra? But again, in supermarkets as well, you know what I mean? You've got often, you've got, you know, two packets of biscuits for the price of one or, you know, so just to be aware that sometimes something's a bargain might not necessarily be a bargain for your body. It might be in monetary terms, but not for your health. So just to be, to be aware of this, and I suppose this just shows that she goes for the Diet Coke, so it's, it's kind of healthy. Um, roughly portions-wise, um, now these are very rough, because obviously everyone's very different, but roughly from an average daily intake, you're looking at 2,000 calories for a woman and 2,500 for a man, and that's for healthy living. So that's not for weight loss um, or weight gain. So obviously if you're losing weight, you would have to subtract from that on a daily basis over time, or if you're gaining weight, add on. Now, size matters. So again, just to show the difference, if you're struggling with weight over time, how little changes can make a big change over time. So if someone, say, perhaps who has a baguette with sausages and rashers, uh, so a breakfast roll, if they were to sw switch that and have um, something like a, a BLT, so they would save two stone in a year by switching the, the breakfast roll for the, the BLT. Again, someone having the sandwich with the cheddar cheese, the rasher and the lettuce and the coleslaw. Again, switching over to a brown bread, healthy alternative. Um, again, one and a half stone over a year. So it's little changes over time. So not denying yourself um, fully, but just making small changes over time can actually hugely add up. Um, other snacks, again, we would hugely advocate that people wouldn't have a lot of high-fat snacks or high-sugar snacks over time. Treats are fine, but again, to try and have a healthy, healthy alternative. So again, they do make a huge difference. You've got the, the muffin, which is over 300 calories, um, whereas a banana is less than half. Packet of crisps versus the yogurt, chips versus potato. So again, these all add up over time if you're, if you're looking at... Um, your weight. So a typical day, what do we do? Make sure you start the day with breakfast, so you break the fast overnight. Something simple like a cereal, um, porridge, toast, an egg, fruit, yogurt um, or fruit juice. Include starchy food at every meal, so something like potatoes, rice, pasta, um, breads, and if you're short on time, go for a sandwich or a jacket potato and have a filling on it. Um, or even a bowl of cereal and some fruit. Anything is better than just grabbing the takeaway or the ready-made meal. Between meals then, to include snacks. Um, so nutritious snacks like fruit, 
vegetables, nuts, yogurts, oat cakes, crackers, and to include bits of cheese, meat and fish on top of that. So it must be um, a good mix, must be variety or, or else it won't work. Healthy snacks to have readily so that if you are peckish or hungry between meals that you have a healthy alternative rather than just going for the chocolate biscuits or the um, packet of crisps. So again, just providing some nice but interesting snacks um, to have either as a small meal or, or in between. If they're not in your cupboards, if you haven't bought them, you won't have them. So it's really important that you make a shopping list and have all the healthier alternatives um, readily at hand. Okay, so exercise. Again, there's a lot of it's a lot of interest, I suppose, in exercise from general health point of view, but also in, in, in the role of depression. So regular exercise may alleviate symptoms of depression. There's a role of exercise in, depre- in, in treating depression, but there's also a lot of evidence out there in the management. There's lots of other benefits. Um, so just to go through some ex- exercise recommendations and where you can get other information. Okay, so brain serotonin. Research has shown that regular exercise may increase the level of serotonin. Um, And what serotonin is, it's a neurotransmitter and it regulates your mood, your sleep, your libido, your appetite and other functions in the body. There are problems in the serotonin pathway of the brain that have been linked to depression. Exercise, aside from the serotonin point of view, increases your levels of endorphins in the brain and that can have mood lifting properties. You'll often see you know, marathon runners or people who've just done a 10K and they're, you know, they're plodding along for the whole time. And then when they get to the end, they are practically smiling and laughing. They are just so overwhelmed with with having done this big run or short run. Um, And it is the endorphins rising when they have achieved this um, exercise. Problems in the serotonin pathways of the brain have been linked to depression. Um, So it is hugely important. Okay, so regular exercise can alleviate symptoms of depression by increasing your energy levels. Um, So again, you know, you start out doing an exercise, you might be tired for the first or second time, but over time you will actually have increased energy levels. Improved sleep, over time again, your your sleep patterns will improve, um, or hopefully will improve, but also exercise can distract you from worries and ruminating, kind of overthinking things or having too much time to think about things. Exercise also provides a social support um, and reduces loneliness if it's done with other people. So, I mean, there's so many sports out there, some that you can do by yourself, like walking, running, um, but then there's a lot of sports that you can do as a group. You know, you can do group running, you can do tennis, you can do swimming, there's lots of sports that you can do either by yourself or as a group. Um, Regular exercise also increases the sense of control and self-esteem by allowing people to take an active role in their own well-being. So it's very much um, self-medicated. Regular exercise can be an effective treatment by itself for non-melancholic depressions, so particularly for people who were previously sedentary or inactive. It doesn't need to be extremely vigorous. Um, So certainly I'm not telling everyone to, you know, start doing a huge amount. A brisk walk each day can be hugely beneficial. So it's even starting out with a small amount if you're not used to doing a huge amount or if you're already very active to to build on that over time. For more severe melancholic depressions, exercise can be a helpful strategy alongside treatments. So nothing is obviously going to take away from the medication or the therapies that people are undergoing but having exercise, it might help people work with it or deal with it um, or cope with it. For those experiencing um, d- depression and experience a lack of energy in the morning, immediate exercise and getting out of bed has been shown to be beneficial also. So regular exercise can be an effective way to relieve some forms of depression and is often neglected in the management of depression just by, by the person themselves sometimes um, because I suppose it's easy to, to go and kind of manage something, but sometimes it's, it's hard to initiate a, a programme. Um, so either to ask for, for help 
through a, a physiotherapist or to ask through help through your doctor, but to work in conjunction with other um, supports. So studies have shown that people who rex- exercise regularly experience fewer symptoms of depression and anxiety than those who don't exercise regularly. And obviously this is going to be quite subjective as well, but there's certainly a lot of positive um, reports out there. A lot of trials have showed that regular um, exercise of moderate intensity can be effective treatment by itself for both melancholic and non-melancholic um, depression. So 16 weeks of regular exercise is equally effective as antidepressant medication in the treatment of mild depression and that was shown in the States. 16 weeks is a long time and um, so again just I suppose to allow something work not just for a small period of time but to give it a good chance but also to find some exercise that you like that you enjoy and that you will maintain long term Um, exercise can further assist depression in individuals with depression who have only partially responded to a medication so aerobic exercise and aerobic exercise will be something like a brisk walk cycling jogging Um, or resistance and strength training have been found to be helpful in treating depression. And again, you can do this through a gym or you can do it yourself. It doesn't have to cost a huge amount of money um, because something like a brisk walk, you can just get up and do yourself. Whereas if you want to do something um, more controlled like um, weightlifting or anything like that, um, the facilities would be within the gyms. So other benefits of exercise, aside from um, its role in in managing depression, will be just for um, the prevention of other diseases. So heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, your bones, strokes, um, and certain types of cancer. So it's got huge benefits for everybody. The Department of Health guidelines for exercise would be that we should take up to 30 minutes a day. And that's not for weight loss, it's not for for any certain condition, but that's what people should be doing generally. And it's the little things that all add up from an exercise point of view. So it doesn't have to be a case of doing a class or going to the gym. It might be a case of walking to work, walking to school, um, getting off the bus a stop earlier, you know, not using your car as much. Just the little things that all add up over time. The physical activity guidelines for the Australians, um, and again the Department of Health also, um, but this is more pertinent to um, the area of depression, would be a minimum of 30 minutes um, of moderate intensity exercise on most, (coughs) preferably all days of the week. So moderate intensity would be your brisk walking. So again, local parks, Um, local roads, if you want to put on music, whatever, phone a friend and head off. Um, But that's what you'd be aiming for depending on um, if you have any other ailments that predispose you from from achieving that. Exercising for at least 10 minutes at a time. Maybe you can't do 30 minutes in a row. Um, You want to break it up into 10 minutes each time, that's fine. Um, But once you're making it up within the day. So you might do 10 minutes to the shop, 10 minutes somewhere else and 10 minutes later on in the day if 30 minutes isn't achievable in one scoop. Being active in many ways as possible each day. So again, if you're in a building and there's a stairs versus a lift, use the stairs. Um, Again, if you're getting off the bus, get off a stop earlier. Um, So it's not necessarily from a weight point of view, but it's from a mental health point of view. Um, So another study there in the States has shown that... um, for 12 weeks, it can significantly reduce symptoms. So there's a lot, there's a lot of evidence out there that it can help. Um, for people who are very inactive, health benefits can be gained by just becoming slightly more active. So if you're going from nothing, a half an hour a day is probably very daunting. Um, so again, just to build it up over time. A little activity is better than none, and more is, little, uh, is better than little. Um, For extra health and fitness, it's recommended that adults who are able and deemed okay by their doctor should also participate in a vigorous activity that makes them huff and puff. So again, these are people who are very fit and able to participate in an ongoing sport. And your doctor will obviously be able to let you know if this is appropriate for you. But it is hugely important um, to make sure that you do push yourself Lots of websites um, in Ireland um, that will help support exercise activities. Um, The Heart Foundation, 
they have a fabulous website and a fabulous um, foundation that will help people um, involve themselves in activities. They also do the Schlina Schleunte around the country as well, which is fantastic from the point of view of walking. Um, physiotherapy department within your hospital or your local health centre. Again, if you have any issues with um, mobility and stuff, they will be able to guide you about you know, levels of intensity that you can get yourself involved with. Local amenities, local clubs, again, they will have lots of sports and activities that you can also get involved with. And gyms, be it um, public or private, again, will provide facilities for people to get involved with. So just to sum up the few changes that hopefully you will take from today, if you're not already doing it, but they are hugely important in that they have the building blocks um, of, of a healthy diet, is to eat regularly throughout the day, have a breakfast. So don't keep fasting after night time through to breakfast, even if it's only a banana, even if it's a breakfast bar, you know, to have something to break that fast overnight. Include starch, protein, vegetables or salad at each meal so that your brain has a steady supply of energy. Choose whole grains, pulses, fresh foods and vegetables where possible. Minimize processed foods um, from the point of view that they have less micronutrients but they also have a high level of trans fats. Ensure that you have an adequate unsaturated fat intake to maintain the cell structure of the brain. Include omega-3 acids or oily fish in your diet, aiming for two to four portions a day. Drink plenty fluid, so six to eight glasses of non-caffeinated drinks, so not teas and coffees, um, so plenty water, or even to put a my wadi, no added sugar into it, um, because hydration can affect your mood. Use the food pyramid as a guide every day. So try and do a snapshot, see how you're doing relative to it, and see if there's anywhere you can improve upon it. Um, if weight is an issue, your portion size might be an issue. So again, just to focus back on what a portion is. Variety of foods is hugely important and aim for five fruit or veg a day. Eat less from the top of the pyramid. So the, the high fat foods or the high sugary foods. So to reduce them um, and eat more from the bottom. And if you drink, drink within sensible limits. Um, so as Eddie Hobbs says, it's like budgeting. You should know what your intake is and your expenditure. Thanks very much.